So instead of Node.js, as he said, this is going to be about new developments in Mahout. Uh, these are recently expanded lightning talks. So uh, I'm going to hope for a lot of questions. Uh, we'll see how much there is to talk about. Mahout, uh, well, let's, we don't need the map our hat today. Uh, Mahout is an Apache project. Uh, you guys must know this because you're here. Uh, for scalable data mining. And it's had a history of rapid expansion early on, and that was a period when we had no idea what people really wanted to use. Over the years, it's become clear more and more what people will use out of Mahout, where it really makes sense. And so what we're doing at the 0 0.7 and 0 0.8 releases is we're turning a little bit. Previously, we were very accepting. Well, we're still very friendly people. But it used to be that any student who wanted to do a project or anybody who thought there might be a neat machine learning algorithm, uh, we would accept the code. And we would stick it into Mahout, and uh, it would be there with everything else. And the result is uh, kind of a lot of bloat. Mahout's not as high a quality as we want, so our first new project is a negative project, and that's to remove things. Now, obviously, the techniques that we use are quite simple. They're like this. It's gone. <laughs> that, that was easy. Uh, in fact, most of it really was easy. And the reasons we're doing it are that there really was a lot of uh, effectively abandoned code. The average code quality, as is typical with brand new code that's not used, that doesn't have people critiquing it, was relatively poor. And uh, we had no users, and we had no maintainers for it. So why do we care? You know, why is it there? Why is it inflating our bad style points? Uh, why don't we just delete it? So the old LDA, which has been replaced by a version that works correctly and faster, uh, both features that the old version did not have. Uh, the old naive base has been replaced by a version that works correctly and faster, both features that the old version didn't entirely have. Uh, the uh, genetic algorithm stuff, the watchmaker stuff, has been removed because, again, uh, the old version, well, it didn't work poorly. It's just nobody used it. And so who could say if it worked poorly or not? So we're removing those, just boop, gone. If you care, send email because this release is happening right now. We're, we're about to go live on that release. Uh, Grant and Robin have been madly typing all during this meeting and uh, probably are typing right now. Uh, yeah, there he is. Uh, Robin's in the front row typing next to Grant. So 0.7 is about to go out the door, and these pieces will be gone. Uh, but our theory is nobody cares, so it shouldn't matter. Second uh, big change is we previously have maintained multiple artifacts. We had a collections artifact, which had fast collections. This was inspired by the Trove package from MIT, which was GPL'd. And we re-implemented that, uh, did a code generation technique to build a whole bunch of primitive class uh, container types that were very fast. I think there's only one uh, container class uh, library out there that's faster. Uh, and it provides the, the substrate for our uh, sparse vectors and things like that. So it had to be good. It had to be pretty fast, and uh, we thought maybe it would be of general use. David Weiss said that he was thinking about using it at one time. It turns out that it's entirely stable, and nobody cares. So we're going to uh, integrate that into the math library, which is also a separate deliverable, and they'll just be together that way. And so uh, we still need those collections, but they're no longer going to be totally first class and independent. And uh, so we put it into math, I put it into math, and I broke the build about two weeks ago. Sorry, guys. But Grant fixed it, so uh, that's what community's all about. I, I break it, he fixes it. Uh, I like this plan. This, I love community. Uh, but thanks, Grant. Uh, it also should work just the same as anybody ever did. It gets rid of a few warnings that people were seeing, uh, but otherwise no changes that anybody will ever see. Uh, some bigger things are coming in future releases. 0 0.7 is a cleanup release. A lot of cleanups are happening in there. And then future releases, 0 0.8 and beyond, are slated for new features. One of the big new features that I'm hoping will get in there is a whole package of 
nearest neighbor algorithms and clustering, uh, these are designed to support nearest neighbor sorts of modeling. And the idea is that, it's a lot like recommendation. You, you say, I want to know if this person will buy my product. Well, let me find a whole bunch of people nearby that person, nearby in some abstract way, similar to, and what did they do? And I'll predict what they did, or at least the average of what they did. And so this is called K-nearest neighbor modeling. Uh, it has a long and uh, wonderful heritage of competition with traditional modeling like neural nets and things like that. Uh, back in the 80s, Alan Lapides kept building these nearest neighbor models and pissing off the guys who were building deeper understanding models because the nearest neighbor models ran as fast and did just as well. So the neural net guys would get better and then the nearest neighbor models would get better. They have the virtue that there's no real training. You just look at the data. And, and so they're really nice for, for a certain sort of flexible modeling. They're also really kind of hard because there's a whole lot of comparisons to be done to find the nearest neighbors. And you want a very deep result set, like 50,000 deep, and you want it to be pretty high quality. And so if you look at trying to do 20 million searches against 25 million reference vectors in, say, 100 dimensions where there's a kilo flop per operation, we start seeing things like 10 to the 17th floating point operations. And that's not good because even with fast computers, that's a long time. An early prototype, for instance, was about a million times too slow uh, for, for this. So that was the project. And so the way we worked on this, it's not done, is we had a two-week hackathon with six vendor or customer-supplied developers. Now they they weren't real hot Java developers at the beginning anyway. They got a lot better. Uh, some were C++ developers, and the re-education plan worked pretty well. The, uh, the idea, though, was that we do very agile style, you know, post-its on the wall sort of development. And uh, the, the interesting thing is because these guys work for a bank. They have very, very strict IP policies. Put it this way, so strict that these guys still use XP because there might be issues in upgrading. XP on their laptops, literally. Uh, I didn't, I, I wondered why it looked familiar. But uh, it was just totally locked down sort of environment. I couldn't work on their stuff. I couldn't look at their data. They couldn't work on proprietary code outside of that because there were ownership issues. Everybody would start pointing to everybody else. So this solution to this totally closed environment was to go totally open. A wonderful paradox there. Uh, Grant says that this happens more than, more than a little. So we did all the development on open source, all the development on synthetic data uh, on individual machines, but the sharing mechanism was only through GitHub. And so they, they could access that, and I never had to touch any of their computers. And open was easier than closed. And the goal was new technology that would facilitate new closed source code that they could use. They weren't too worried about the technology because that's published work. It wasn't their secret sauce anyway. And there's an ambitious goal there. We wanted it to run a million times faster. You know, factor two, factor 10, that's no big deal, but a million's a big number. And the good news is that's really only about 100 or 1,000 because the, the reference case was pretty poor. It was written in SAS, SAS has strange numerics, it was written in SAS scripting, so there was a lot working against it. And so we really only had about a factor of a thousand, maybe a little more, to work against. And the mechanisms that we used is we changed the Mahout math library. And the things that Mahout's math library does really well, it's not so fast, it's not so dense, it's not so comprehensive, but what it does extraordinarily well is it's extensible. And the test cases are extensible, so you can build a very simple vector or matrix and you can say, just test that. And Mahout will test it for you in a very nice way. And that lets you have high confidence you've implemented something new that's correct, and it's also very few lines of code. So we built a delegating vector, which has a vector inside, but then it has mo extra magic and everything's handled. We have a weighted vector, which says I have the weight of 10, 
sort of thing. And we built a centroid, which is a weighted vector that understands how to add other centroids. This is for clustering. We built uh, a searcher interface, which is contradictory to the Mahout search API, so we're going to have to fix that. Uh, but it had a projection search. I'll talk about that in a sec. It had a k-means search, and, uh, a local locality-sensitive hashing search, and a brute force search. The brute force search is just there for test cases. Uh, the LSH search works by taking umpty ump 32 or 64 random vectors and looking to see if a particular point is kind of in the same direction or not. And that can reduce the, the, the operation of a dot product to a, an XOR, a bitwise XOR, which is obviously faster than a thousand floating point operations. And then we can just do the real distance computation on things that appear to be quite close in the XOR operation, which is noisy, but, but good. And that cuts down on the number of operations. K-means does another kind of acceleration, again, by avoiding operations. Those can be used together. K-means avoids a bunch of operations, and then LSH can be used to accelerate the, the internal search inside there. And projection search does yet another algorithm for not doing as much work. Now, these also required that we build a new clustering framework, so we built that as well. Here's how projection search works. Uh, if you have data, the, 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 the black points are data. If you haven't seen data before, that's what they look like. Uh, and we're projecting those, because we're assuming that the geometry works the way geometry works in high school or something like that, which is not always true, but it's, it's general enough that's a good assumption. And if points are nearby in the original data, then they will be nearby in the projected form. We're projecting them onto this line here, this very faint line, which I hope you can see. And so if they're nearby before, they will be nearby after. Now there's a chance that if they're far apart, like these two points, that they will be nearby afterwards. And so the points that are nearby in the projection will contain the points that are nearby in fact and some imposters. So we have a problem of false positive, but the real virtue here is by projecting it onto a line, we can use a tree set to store the data. And there's very nice, efficient operations you can do. Well, in fact, we can use any sorted set. This line, this projection, provides an ordering of these data points. And if we look at this, as we change the dimension that we're searching in, we get a pretty high chance of finding the nearest neighbor within a few nearest points in the projection. At 100 dimensions, it's still around 0.1. That sounds pretty bad, 90% chance of being wrong. But if we use a bunch of these projections, say 20, then the chance of being not finding the nearest point drops because the chance of 90% not finding it times the 90% chance of not finding it in the second projection and so on multiplies. And so with two projections, there's a 0.8 chance of being wrong. We've doubled our chance of being right and so on. And after 20, we have a 90-something percent chance of being right. That's not bad. And in lower dimensions, this is often in fraud models, the range that they work, 10 to 30 dimensions, you get even better performance just right out of the bat. And also in real data, this is for randomly distributed data, real data is considerably better than this. So the projection search is the first system that we're building in this. The k-means search is different. The, it's a simple idea, you pre-cluster the data ahead of time, and then to find nearby points, you find nearby clusters and search them, probably using a projection search. And it's recursive, because inside the searching of a cluster, we use a searcher. Uh, that's kind of a fun characteristic. So here's data. These data are red, if you'll notice. And we want to find points that are close to the x. It's pretty easy if they're two-dimensional. So what we're going to do is we're going to cluster them. The black points are the cluster centroids after a k-means uh, algorithm applied to this. It doesn't matter that the data doesn't look very clustery. The clustering is just a way of describing the density of the data. Notice the clusters are closer together where there's lots of data points. And if we draw the boundaries between the clusters, we see that. That's called a Voronoi tessellation. 
And so now we can put our data point back on there and we can see that all of the points nearby the X are in the clusters that are nearby the X. And that property holds up to moderate dimensionality, about 50 to 100, it still works pretty well. Again, you get some false negatives and some false positives, but the general idea makes it unnecessary to search a lot of the data. We don't have to look in this cluster, this one, this one, this one, this one, or this one. I'm sorry, this one we do have to look at. Uh, but you get the idea. It, it makes it easier by not doing more work than we need. But now we need a k-means algorithm, a, a clustering algorithm. Hadoop is very poor, and the, the Mahout implementation of k-means clustering is very slow. <coughs> Ironically, that's made a lot of people very happy because they benchmark against our code, and theirs looks very good. Uh, but it doesn't make any of the users happy, it just makes people like GraphLab very happy. They say 10 times better. <laughs> Only 10 times better? Uh, so we need a new one, though, that, that really is fast. And uh, <coughs> normal MapReduce isn't going to do it if we use an iterative algorithm, because it takes so long to start each MapReduce. Maybe Pregel things like my giraffe might work, or they might not. We don't know yet. Those are still very young. <coughs> the streaming k-means algorithm that we use, on the other hand, is interesting because it makes one pass through the data. So in a MapReduce implementation, we would only have to make one MapReduce program, and that gets rid of the iterative cost. And it is also very fast. On a single machine, it takes about 20 microseconds per data point, or a minute for a million. Yeah, that's at 10 dimensions. At 100, it would be 10 minutes for a million data points, which is still quite fast. And it's perfectly parallelizable. The way it works is for each new data point, and we see how close it is to the nearest cluster, if it's within a threshold, then we might attach it to that cluster with a probabilistic sort of thing. If it's outside the threshold, we make it into a new cluster. Once the number of clusters grows to a certain point, I'm being rescued, I'm so glad. Uh, once we get to a certain number of clusters, what we do is we recursively, thank you, <coughs> we recursively cluster all the clusters to reduce the number of those. And if the number of clusters decreases dramatically, then we think that's good. If it doesn't decrease dramatically, then we increase that little threshold that we're using so that the next time around it will decrease. And the result's a very large number of centroids. It's a very, very fuzzy clustering, you know, maybe 10,000 or 1,000 centroids. We don't use those as the actual clustering. We use those as a surrogate for the main data, and we use we apply a real clustering algorithm to those centroids, which we can do in memory, and so it's very, very fast. They pass through this data. It only looks at each data point once, and when we recursively cluster the centroids, we don't restart, we just keep going. You know, if we kind of lose track of some of the early data points, we don't care, because all we want is a surrogate for the distribution of our data, which we then produce the final clustering. And there are theoretical results that say that this will produce, that final clustering will be very close to an optimal clustering of the original data. It's exciting. Here's how the parallel speed up looks. Uh, this is number of threads horizontally versus the time taken, both on a logarithmic scale. So it should be a, it should be a linear line downwards. And indeed it is. This is for a threaded version and down to nearly 16 cores, as you would expect. It's linear. The last few things David pointed out to me are probably not getting perfect speed up. That's down here because we're competing with the JVM's garbage collection threads. There's two to four of those typically running as we create garbage during the clustering. And so those need retime, and we effectively only have a 12 or 14 core machine here. This was run on one of those nice new CC2 8x large. I mean, just it sounds so cool. Uh, I, I really blew the budget too. I, I spent $37 last month doing these tests. Um, 
I'll, I'll just go with that. So we got par parallel speed up. And it looks like, for enough data, that we'll get pretty much perfect parallel speed up in the MapReduce version as well. We'll just run this algorithm on every piece of the data, get a whole bunch of clusters for each piece of the data, throw those to the reducer and take it as it is, or do the recursive clustering on those, and we're done. So it's going to be perfectly par parallelizable as far as we are care. Now, unfortunately, the inner loop, so remember we're doing this clustering so we can do the nearest neighbor, but inside the nearest, or inside the loop of this k-means cluster, we have to find the nearest cluster, right? So we need a searcher. <laughs> we get to recurse again. And even when we're recursively clustering these things, we could even recurse inside that. So this is just so much fun for an XLisp programmer. Uh, and so we have classes that accelerate that, that search for the nearest centroid. Because the centroids are vectors, they can be clustered just like vectors are, because they are vectors, and they can also be searched for just like vectors. And so we, do, we use those other classes. We, of course, do not use the k-means searcher to find the k-means cluster, because this talk is only 40 minutes. So that's what the, the clustering stuff is, and we have high hopes for this. It has achieved now, uh, within a factor of two to four of the required speed up for the, the customer in, in the big bank that, that commissioned this work. And uh, I think that it's gonna massively accelerate a lot of the text applications. David Weiss has said that he's all excited about this because he does text clustering for a living and he thinks that this might be able to give him scalability that he didn't have before. Grant says he's all excited just because he loves clustering things anyway. And, uh, and it looks like it's gonna give very nice results as well. And the other potential here is that it gets rid of the, the 80% of the questions on the Mahout mailing list have to be, I was trying to cluster, and what are these T1 and T2 parameters? I set them opposite of the way the documentation said to set them, and I got kind of weird results. And we say, did you try setting them the way that it says in the documentation? They say, yeah, I tried that too, and I got weirder results. And hopefully those questions will just go away, because this should be simpler, there's no knobs, the system adapts to the data and just figures it out. The last thing I'm gonna talk about, about new stuff, and this is very science fiction-y because it may or may not be real. It may or may not become part of Mahout. It may or may not cause an entire pig module to appear in Mahout. It really depends on people. People who wanna use it, people who wanna to try to contribute to it. So pig vector, is a way to access Mahout functionality, especially model training, especially in memory model training using SGD right now, from, uh, from PIG, and, and so that's cool. Right now it does text vectorization, converting text to vectors. That's a, a sore point on the mailing lists as well because it's complicated the way it is now, and this makes it fairly simple. It does classification in a kind of weak way and it saves models, and that's about it. Uh, it also only kind of works. It doesn't really work. No normal human has been able to build and use it yet. Uh, but it does have some promise, and there's also some promise that we'll be able to get access to PigML, which is the parallel Twitter project that seems to do very similar things. Uh, to compile it and install it, it's just like you'd expect. Uh, Maven install, Maven package, uh, sort of thing, except that the second case right now depends on Elephant Bird and an early version which doesn't quite work, and it depends on YAML Beans, which is a package that's not in Maven, and when I approached the author about it, he said some not very nice things about Maven. I, 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 I'll take that under advisement, but uh, it didn't seem that there was any promise of getting that into Maven Central or getting a coherent build from the author. And so uh, that's gonna have to be fixed. The, the build is not right. Tokenization is done using a thing called a text encoder. And the way we build that is we give it three arguments. The dimension of the vector we want, uh, description of which variables we want, you know, like we want the description and the title. So we'd say description plus title. And then we also have to pass in the schema of the data that pig has. I haven't been able to figure out how to ask pig that for that schema. 
and it may not be possible indeed. Uh, so we have to tell it what kinds of things we're giving it. So here's, a, here's an example. We're, these would all be on one line normally. We're going to define an encode vector function. It's using the class encode vector. Here's the dimension 10. I did that to shorten the lines. Should be 100,000 or something. And I say I'm going to use the variable x, the variable y, and the offset. This is a constant offset to make the model work better. X is numeric and Y is a word variable. Now, Z is a text variable, but we're ignoring that. So we don't, we, we put a full scheme in there, but we don't have to include it. So if we want to do flexible modeling, all we have to change is this. We can include or exclude variables without changing the schema of the data coming in. And where it says text, we could put parentheses and we could put in a Lucene analyzer. I did a 3.1 because I did this some months ago. Uh, we should be using 3.4, which is what Mahout currently uses. So that formula is not normal arithmetic. It describes which variables, and it also describes which interactions you'd like. Interactions are very important. So for instance, you might have a product description text and a user ID. And you want to understand which product descriptions sell in general, but you'd also like to know which product description words appeal to this user. And so you would say uh, description plus user ID, because you want to say, does this user like things in general, plus description times user, star. Now, there's a limitation on the interactions that you can do. You can do uh, bigger expressions, like you'd say parenthesis x plus y, parenthesis up arrow to mean all of X and Y and all their interactions. Now, there's a limitation in that it doesn't do anything yet, but it parses it really well. I'm very proud of the parser. Uh, but it's, it's there, you know, it's ready to go. And the underlying encodings all handle the things. There's just a missing bit of glue. So here's how you load and encode some data. Uh, pig loads data like this. We're gonna load comma separated data and we're going to load it as x1, x2, and x3. And then we're going to encode it using the encode vector function we defined before. And star, we give it all the fields. Now, there's some pretty odd subtleties there. And so far, the, what I recommend is just use star. Uh, in pig, the, the passing of a single thing or a multiple things is subtle. And then we can store it using some elephant bird massive incantation here. That defines the class to be used for deserializing uh, data the, or serializing the key, serializing the value, and the ultimate type of the value that should be received so that it can use reflection ETH type things. Training a model, now this is really unreadable, but the pieces of it are the name of the class and then a big string here. The string has a little micro language that says here's parameter values. And the biggest one there is the categories, right here. That's unwieldy. That needs improvement. More improvements. Uh, there's uh, plenty of opportunities for volunteers here. Anybody who wants this stuff to work, wants this to be good, wants it to be in Mahout, should step up and say, you know, fork it on GitHub. So there's reservations. P pig vector isn't done. It's ugly. Doesn't work. And it's hard to build. Other than that, it's really good uh, and seems to have some promise, uh, but all it has is promise, as far as I can tell. Uh, some thoughts about it. We might want to add Naive Bayes, that, especially with Robin's latest work. That Naive Bayes package is getting very usable and very nice. Maybe we should simplify the syntax, have a configuration file instead of the big monster string. Uh, we should try a recent version of Elephant Bird. Uh, again, volunteers uh, or uh, test subjects are very, very much welcome. Uh, maybe we should switch to PigML and just carry some features into there. So that's what we have thinking about in Mahout. Uh, as always, you can contact me later this evening. Slides will be up on that page. Uh, I'm sure they'll be up on the uh, Buzzwords page as soon as I put it on this USB drive. Uh, any questions? Do we have, and do we have minions who could carry microphones around? Yeah, we do. Sebastian Minion and the other guy. 
So, any questions? I can't see. There's a person standing up. Nope, that's not a question. Okay. Um, what I do in these situations is I assign... Qu oh, no, good, that we have a volunteer. Good. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Is there any plan to have uh, something like PIG um, in a streaming interface? So um, to have a constant model training and an incremental SVD or something like that? Uh, Mahout already does that, but PIG really doesn't. So uh, to some degree you can do that. PIG right now is totally batch oriented and runs MapReduce. There is no version of PIG that I know of that does real streaming computations, say, in a a storm or other framework. Now, you can, with PIG Vector right now, load a model from a previously trained version, this is with the SGD, do some more training, and then store it back out. Uh, that, like all of the other features, almost works. Uh, but other than that style of incremental training, which is very batch-oriented, there are no plans. I have no plans. Uh, if you see a good way to do that, I'd be thrilled. Uh, we, sh we should talk. Uh, I don't see an easy way to do real on-the-fly learning from a pig syntax. Does that answer? Okay. I, I don't know is always a good answer, or I don't think so. Uh, any other people? Now, with only one question, we're going to have to assign questions. No, good. This is working rather well. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, probably a bit naive question because I'm not so much familiar with this uh, Mahout, but uh, some classification tasks, they require um, some changes in the core of, of a machine learning method, like Bayesian classification. For example, for sentiment detection, you would like to normalize by uh, length of a text, and it goes pretty much in the core of the algorithm. So do you plan or do you already provide a way to hack into the like modal on this level? Uh, Mahout definitely provides that capability. Uh, it's very easy to extend or to change Mahout models. Uh, it's very easy to change and extend, uh, mod modify the vectors uh, using the standard vector math libraries. But, uh, but it's really, yeah, we, do, we have a several things like that. But from the, M from the pig interface, it's particularly unpleasant. And the reason for that is that PIG doesn't have a way, again, as far as I know, to carry around a data type or a data structure of a bit given type other than the ones that PIG understands. And so things have to be carried around as a serialized vector. And if we touch that vector inside PIG, we have to deserialize it, touch it, and reserialize it at pretty substantial cost relative to the cost of the actual math. So if we do this, it, it, it's just really going to be bad. And I, probably what I would try to do is put something into the language that describes those variables. We do have code, as Robin's about to say. So uh, what I was trying to say was there, you can normalize vectors two ways. One, when you encode the actual vectors, we have options in, in, the, in the encoder job itself to allow you to normalize, both based on length or, or if you want to do an error. Uh, a norm of the vector, you can do that. Or you can, once once the vector is already generated, you can actually read them back and use the Mahout library to manipulate the vector and renormalize before feeding it to the actual algorithm, so. Right, and so where we do the actual uh, training algorithm here, it calls Java code pretty dramatic, pretty early in that process, and it would be pretty easy to make that more easily pluggable. Uh, that would give you the flexibility you need. Mahout's very, again, the trademark is extensibility and scalability uh, in these learning algorithms, and so it's very easy for you to change them. It's just the boilerplate around it is what we're trying to get rid of. I saw a microphone headed over here. Did it? No. More questions? How many people here use Mahout? I'll start asking you questions. Wow, that's great. That looks like 10%, 15%. Uh, how many people are curious about it or would like to use it? Okay, that's a whole lot more. That's kind of bad. Uh, can we do some sort of distributed consensus? Just 
uh, try to take turns, but shout out why you're not using it now. And you guys are whispering. I said shout. Can R. you tell us a typical so, use case just for curiosity? Uh, you guys have the use cases. I mean, I have my own. But So somebody says R as one reason for not using Mahout. That's a great answer, because R does things that Mahout never will. Uh, but what it doesn't do is what Mahout does do, which is scalability. Other reasons for not using Mahout? PhDs need jobs. Well, Mahout is made to order for that because it almost works. And if you have a PhD, you can convince people that you can do things with Mahout that nobody else can because it's easily demonstrable that nobody else can. You don't have to prove the other part yet. You can say, that's my job. <laughs> so, uh, so that's not a good excuse for not using it. Uh, somebody else? Why not use Mahout? Lack of a PhD. Ah, uh, that's a sad reason, isn't it? I don't think you need, Robin, do you need a PhD? No. No, he doesn't have a PhD. I, I can't comment. Grant? I don't have a PhD. There you go. So, you know, two out of three. Isabel? Three out of four. Yeah, and we can ask Sebastian real quickly. He still doesn't have his, but he's about to, I'm sure. So uh, we're, we're at four out of five, don't have a PhD uh, right now. Uh, so, yeah, you could do it. That's not a good reason. Somebody else. Why not use it? At, the, the, all those hands went up. Why not use the mood? You have better things to do. Many other things. Well, that's a very good reason. I'm sure your boss likes that reason. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, sometimes I don't understand the benefit either. I mean, it, it's, it can be hard to verbalize without a proof of concept, which is another good reason to try it, as we need a proof of concept. Uh, but it's true that businesses don't understand it. You really have to have time to play and experiment. Do we have any more real questions from you guys, not from me? Yes, there's a hand. So this is also a, a kind of beginner question. Um, what I didn't understand was, you know, how this pig fits together to Mahout. So what is the part of pig playing? Pig is playing the part of glue. One of the problems with using Mahout is that the examples are 100 or 200 line Java programs. And they have lots of semicolons and distractions in there that make it really kind of hard to tell what the data is having done to it, what the transformations are, and where the line between Mahout and Mahout example is. And the theory is that with a pig, you can say, oh, I'm going to bring in the data here, I'm going to mash it these ways, and then I'm going to feed it to Mahout these other ways. And that might make it much easier to adopt pig into production even without a PhD or a boss saying it's okay to do it. You know, if it takes three hours, you can fake it. Uh, and, and if you get some benefit in that time, then you can say, hey, look, I stole three hours from you, and look, this works, this is interesting. And previously, the, the learning time, the, the beginning time for Mahout was really longer than three hours, except for the, the recommendation part where people could get up and running pretty easily. And, not surprisingly, the recommendations are what people have put into production for the most part. And I think that there's a lot of scope for other things as well. Any other questions? How's our, okay. No? All right, let's thank the speaker. Okay. Thank you.